Open your Bibles up this morning to the book of Esther. And the book of Esther, chapter 9, page 743 in your Bible. Before we read this, I want to show a, a couple short videos of Luke and Lion. Um, a, a, about six years ago, we were in Israel. I'm on the board of Israeli Ally Foundation, and uh, where we help write the policy of moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So when America, the first ones, acknowledged that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, moved through President Trump, as exactly how he said he would, moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it was a very powerful political, spiritual time. Everybody said it would create World War III. Nothing happened. In fact, it launched the uh, Abraham Accord in, in the Middle East that was going real well until Hamas attacked Israel. But while we were there afterwards, I was out having dinner, Pastor Scott and myself, and some politicians from Israel and, and from Washington, D.C., and a friend of mine's uh, phone rang, and it was his wife, and she said, do you know where it's, it's late for us in Israel? And she said, do you know where Pastor Larry is? And she said, well, he's right here. And so she said, I've got to talk to him. God said, I have to talk, tell him right now. I can't wait till tomorrow. And so he, he put me on the phone, and I know this family. They're, they're wonderful, wonderful Christian people. And she said, Pastor, I know it's late, but God said, I have to tell you right now. I can't wait till the morning. God gave me a word for you. I don't know what it means, but she said, lion will roar. The lion will roar from Jerusalem. And we're thinking, well, we're here, you know, the lion of Judah. And she said, I don't know what it means, but I had to tell you now, not tomorrow, now. And we said, okay, and we figured, you know, this is a real breakthrough for Israel and people standing with Israel. About two minutes later, Luke, my son, calls, and Jen on the line, and she said, they said, Dad, you got to pray for Lion, which is our grandson. He was seven months old. Got to pray for Lion. Something's really wrong with him. We're rushing him to the emergency. When we got home a couple days later, we all went to the hospital. We prayed that it wouldn't be what they said it was, and, but we walked in and they said, Lion has a very rare form of leukemia. And they didn't tell us then, but no child had ever survived that kind of leukemia. No child in, in history. And then they called us back a few weeks later and they said, we checked worldwide with all the cancer, children's cancer around the world. Lion has a gene in him that there's no medical history anywhere in the world. A child his age has this gene. And we said, what does it mean? Well, it means that there was no treatment for him to, we think maybe we can help. And so here we are six years later, Lion uh, has gone from seven months old to kindergarten. And so I wanna show this, these two things to you. It's a little clip that Luke and Jen put out. They do a charity thing for kids in the hospital. But I, then I wanna show you Lion just a couple days ago and let you know that whenever you hear or see of a miracle in somebody else's life, what does that mean? It means you're next. So watch this video, these two little short videos. Oh, can you play it? This is so Wait, cool. Yeah, here Here's we go. two Fender electric guitars and an amp we dropped off today at Cook's Children's Hospital. Here we are dropping them off to Sonny, who works in the music department. And here's Sonny singing That's to our Lion. son, That's Lion, who is about eight months old, getting treatment for leukemia. Here we gave some cookies to the nurses. That's Dylan on the left. And there Dylan is, a few years back, taking care of Lion when Lion was in the hospital at Cook's getting treated for uh, cancer. Here's me and Lion chilling out in our hospital room. Me, Jen, and Lion lived there for over six months. And when Jen was dropping the guitars off, she ran into Dr. Valance, who was Lion's doctor and saved his life. Yeah, so we have a foundation called Free Music where we give free quality instruments to kids facing or have gone through life-threatening illnesses. If you know a kid who's gone through something and would like an instrument, hit us up. All right, now stop. Can you stop it real quick? Can you stop that? Can you stop it? Hold on. All right, so, so they gave Lion no chance to survive. Obviously, he survived a miracle. I mean, the, the, they started calling the gene a lion gene, a god gene. It's a miracle. And so through that, Luke and Jen started a foundation. And I just the reason I showed it to you is to show you Lion when he was seven months old and and 
six months in the hospital, tubes everywhere in his head and everything. And uh, through that, they, they do these things, uh, all kinds of things for kids in the hospital because it's a very traumatic time. And so Luke and Jen started a thing where they would get guitars and instruments and stuff and give it to kids that are going through cancer treatment uh, in, uh, in the hospital. And, and so kids can get out of their room. And you know, Luke and Lion and Jen were in that room for six months. And, uh, and so they started this music thing, all right? And so now this, this is Lion uh, a couple nights ago, kindergarten, at a talent show uh, here in uh, the, the area. So this is Lion six years later. Have fun, bud. the story upside down. All right. Read with me this. Uh, for, for those of you that don't know the story of uh, the, uh, Esther, es the book of Esther uh, is a book that when the sages were putting the Bible together, they debated whether or not to put the story of Esther in the Bible. And the reason is Esther is the only book in the entire Bible that doesn't mention the name of God. And the reason is, is because when so many things are going, what looks like going wrong for the Jewish people, God is working behind the scenes to turn the story upside down. Now, let me reiterate this. This is the only book in the Bible that God isn't seen. He, it, it doesn't look like he's there. It doesn't look like he's answering prayer. And the name of God is not even mentioned. But the story of that is the reason it's not mentioned is to let you and I know that when something seems impossible, God is still there and he is working on your behalf. What Satan is meaning for evil, God is using that to turn your story upside down. Do you receive that this morning? Read the story of Esther. Esther, Esther is the story that Israel is in Babylonian captivity and... Uh, um, the, the evil man Haman tricks the king into writing a decree that all Jews will be killed. And so this is where Mordecai, Esther's uncle, comes and says to her for such a time as this. So read with me in the book of Esther, chapter 9, verse 17. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, which is right now, and on the 14th day of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day, as well as on the 14th day. And on the 15th day of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. So today on Purim is a day of, of the greatest joy to celebrate because of the miracles God is doing for us right now. Therefore, the Jews of the, uh, of the villages who dwelled in, un uh, in unwalled towns celebrated the 14th day, the month of Adar, as a day of gladness and feasting, as a holiday for sending uh, presents to one another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in the providence, the king of Asherah, both near and far, to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar, as days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies 
as the month which turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning, I can't read it, I've written on it too much, from mourning to a holiday that they should make themselves a day of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another's and gifts. So the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun as Mordecai had written down because Haman, that's your enemy, the son of the Hemathos, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and had cast per, that is the lot, that's rolling of the dice, to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged from the gallows. And so they call these days Purim or Purim after the name Pur, therefore because of the words of the letter that they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed upon themselves and their descendants and all who should join them, that's us, that without fail we should celebrate these two days every year according to his written instructions and according to the prescribed times. So here we have a situation which is so powerful for you and I to grab a hold of. Now, I say this all the time that God is God 24-7. Every moment of every day, God is God. But there are those appointed times in which God is more powerful and God is more uh, 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 his, his blessings are stronger, his, his anointing is stronger. Today, right now, is one of those times, and this is a time not so much for a spiritual miracle, but a physical miracle in your life that covers every other thing. Now, let me tell you real quick the story of Mordecai and Esther and, and Haman. The book of Esther in Hebrew is called Hester Panim, and Hester Panim literally means the hidden face of God, that we don't feel God, we don't see God, we don't experience God, but yet everything that looks like it's negative is actually working to turn the story upside down. All things, we live by Romans eight twenty eight. All things, somebody say all things. All things work together for good. Man, this looks bad. All things work together for good. This looks like it's the enemy. All things work together for good. So let me tell you real quick the story of Esther. Israel's in Babylonian captivity, and I'm going to say it real quick. Israel's in Babylonian captivity. Um, they have uh, begin to... to um, assimilate with the Babylonians and leave their, their religion and leave their Jewish tradition. And in as much as the king calls for, now there was a king when they originally came there that was for the Jews and, and, and took care of the Jews, but there was a king that came after him and his advisors came and said, listen, now's the time to destroy the Jews. God is finished with the Jews. God is done with them because there was a prophecy that said after Israel became captives that there would be 70 years, God would set them free and they would come back to Israel and rebuild the temple. But they missed in that God said that when Israel was defeated during versus when Israel was brought into captivity. So when Jerusalem, when Israel was brought into captivity, it was 14 years later that Jerusalem was defeated, that the temple was destroyed. So when the wise men of the world came and said, the 70 years are gone, God's done with Israel, it's over, there's nothing that he'll do for them anymore. They actually missed it by 14 years, and God wasn't finished with Israel. So in thinking that God is now done with Israel, and Babylon and the king will now rule the world because there is no God anymore, he's not seen amongst the Jews, 
The king throws this giant party. It goes on for days and days and days. And unfortunately, a bunch of the Jewish people came to the party and was part of the celebration. They actually used things from the temple that they stole from Jerusalem. And so here they are violating the, 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 the things of the temple, and Jews were actually being involved with the celebration of the destruction of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, we see that happening today. We see Jews that are standing for Israel. We see Jews that are against Israel and against God. We see the same thing. So history is repeating itself. So this party went on for months and months and months. It's a big drunken orgy, and the king is bragging about how beautiful his wife is, the Queen Vashi. And so they begin to say, well, show us how beautiful he is. she is. And so this pagan king who thinks he's taken the place of God, he calls for his wife Vashi to come out in a stage of undress. And she refuses. And so others in the party start making fun of the king. How can you rule a kingdom when you can't even control your wife? And so this guy, he's using a different name now. We later see his name is Haman. He said, how can you rule these people when you can't even control your wife? And the king says, what should I do? And he said, you ought to kill your wife, kill the queen, and make room for a queen who will stand with you. And so they kill the queen Vashi. Now remember, all things work together for good. So the queen is dead, and so the king puts out a call throughout the whole Babylonian kingdom to find the most beautiful person, the most beautiful woman who will be his bride. It goes on for 12 months. For a while, Esther was able to hide because she did not want to be a part of that world. But eventually she was brought there, and so all the women came out and paraded themselves in front of the king. Uh, Esther uh, put no makeup on. She didn't, she didn't dress herself uh, uh, provocatively, and yet when she came out, her inner beauty, the presence of God, drew the king to her, and so the king chooses Esther to be his queen. Now, the thing that the king didn't understand was that Esther was a Jew. She hid being a Jew. Mordecai, who was a chief advisor under the king, told her, don't tell the king that you're a Jew. Now, there was another guy who, for 22 years, had been a barber in the Babylonian area. He'd been a barber. He was nothing, but he weaseled his way in. This is the guy who convinced the king to kill his bride, to kill the queen. And so he moved up in the ranks and be, eventually became um, probably the second most powerful guy with Mordecai under the king. And so he goes to the king and he says, listen, everybody needs to bow down to you. Everybody needs to worship you. Now, what most of you know, but maybe some of you don't know, is Haman is a descendant of Agag. Agag is the, is the, was the king uh, that when Israel left Egypt, they, Israel was going this way, Agag's people were this way, but they followed the, the Jews and killed the, the elderly, killed the women, kidnapped them. Killed them. They're the descendants of Hamas today. They are the, the, the people who, for no reason, want the Jews to be destroyed. So Haman is the grandson of Agag, and he tricks the king into saying, listen, these people are not honoring you. And so the king says, well, what should we do? And he said, well, put a figure of, of, on my chest, and when I walk through the kingdom, I will be representing you, and everyone who sees that, that image of you needs to bow down. And so the king said, well, that's a good idea. That feeds my ego. And so uh, Haman began to walk around. But when he got to Mordecai, who he knew was a Jew, Mordecai refused to bow down. And so Haman goes back to the king, 
and said, listen, these Jews are rebellious. These Jews won't bow down to, to you. And the king said, what should we do? And he said, write a decree that every Jew should be killed. And so the king, not knowing that his bride, whom he loves dearly, the king makes a decree that every Jew in the kingdom would be killed. And so he says, what day should we do this? And this is where we get the word Purim. The word Purim comes from the word Purim, which means to roll the dice or to cast lots. And so Haman, wanting to prove that God is not involved any longer with the Jewish people, there's no divine destiny for the Jewish people. It's all chance. It's all by chance. So he rolls the dice, and when he rolls the dice, the dice come up 113. Now, 113 is, celebrates one. It's the day of Moses' death. And so Haman says, I've taken the place of Moses. I am now the most important prophet in history. But what he didn't know is 113 is, yes, it is the date of Moses' death, but it's also the date of Moses' birth. But what's even more important, remembering Haman is a descendant of Agag, 113 is the numerical equivalence to the name of Agag. And so he is excited. This proves that God is not involved with the Jewish people. Everything is by chance. I rolled the dice, and it came up the name of Agag. But remember, this is the hidden face of God. This is the upside-down story. And yes, when he rolled the dice, it came up 113, which is the numerical equivalent of Agag, but on the bottom, it came up 664, which is the numerical equivalent of the name of King David. And so even though on the surface it looks like Agag, the enemy, is beating you, we who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus and King David and the heir Jesus is working underneath on our behalf. Somebody say amen. Isn't that amazing? And so, and so this is when uh, the decree is put out that all the Jews are going to be killed. Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Esther, for such a day as this, this is why you're put into this situation. So Mordecai tells uh, Esther, he said, you need to go before the king and tell him what's going on. Now, Esther says, I haven't seen the king for six months. No one was allowed to just go to the king, even the queen. You had to be invited. If you just showed up, you could be put to death. And so she, Mordecai says to Esther, if you hold your peace, don't think you and your family won't be destroyed. And that's a great lesson on the side for all of us because we're, we're in a time right now when America is more divided than it's ever been before. And a lot of people are saying, well, when it comes to election, you know, I better look out for myself. I better vote for who will take care of me. When it comes to doing anything, we always do what is the righteous thing to do. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. Doesn't matter whether it looks like it benefits you or not. Understand this. When you and I do the righteous thing, it always benefits us. But when we don't do the righteous thing, it always destroys us. Remember what Mordecai said to Esther? He said, Esther, if you're silent, don't think you and your family won't be destroyed. But God will raise up someone else. Now listen to that. In other words, if you do what's right, you're going to be a part of what God is doing. But if you don't do what's right, you and your family will be destroyed. You won't escape just because you're in the kingdom. But God will raise up somebody else. In other words, God's going to have victory, so he might as well use us to be a part of that victory and receive the blessing. And, you know, just a side note on this, when he says you and your family will be destroyed, what, it, what he's saying is a, a, a side note of that is not just physically destroyed, but your family name will not be remembered. 
Yeah, you're the queen, but nobody will remember you. But Esther did the right thing, called for a fast, called for everybody to call on God. And not only did she physically survive, but here we are 2,500 years later celebrating her name forever because when we do what's right, God gets behind us. Amen? Now, a side note of this, right before this happened, Mordecai, Esther's, hus- uh, Esther's uncle, discovered a plot by these two guys that are working in the kitchen at the kingdom to poison the king. And so he stops them, saves the king's life, but the king doesn't know it. Even though the king doesn't know it, he, it's written down in the chronicles of what's going on in the kingdom. So Esther finally uh, uh, goes before the king and uh, unannounced walks in. Instead of, him, instead of him calling for her death, he looks at her. He just he, 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 Now she dresses up. She looks good. She's, a, she's got makeup on. She's got a good dress on. She's got her hair combed. Lady, that's a hint. <laughs> and she comes in, and it, it, in, Hebrew, in Hebrew, the king says, hubba hubba. And she looks at, he looks at her and he says, oh, my goodness. He said, oh, I, Esther, I love you. You're, I love you. I, well, name anything, anything you want, anything you want. And, and God moved his heart far. And she said, you know, honey, I just want to spend more time with you. I just want to be with you. How, how can we do this? Let's have a special dinner. He goes, okay, we'll do that. And she said, and would you invite Haman? Oh, Haman, he's the one that has called for the death of the Jews. He's the descendant of Agag. And Haman hears that Esther has asked him to be a part of this, this private uh, meal, this private dinner. And so he goes home to his wife and says, man, this is going to be amazing. I'm, I'm going in, in with Esther, the queen and the king. They're going to honor me and all this. Now, Haman's Haman's wife was a witch. She was involved with witchcraft. Matter of fact, it was her father who, when the first king released some of the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, he's the guy, her dad was the guy who tried to stop it. And so they, they hate the Jews. They're involved with witchcraft. Uh, she's the one who said you need to build the gallows and make them 50 cubits high, which is, you think about a, a hangman gallows, 75 feet tall. And there's a whole revelation in why she wanted it to be 50 cubits high. It's amazing. You know, you, all you need is 10 feet to hang somebody. She said, build them 50 cubits. There's a reason for that. But so he, he comes back, and, and he goes to the dinner, and it's all going well, and, and, and the king is just in love with Esther, and Haman's there, and he says, uh, what do you want? I, I just want I love you so much. I just want to do anything for you. She said, Let's have another dinner. Let's have another dinner and bring Haman again. She knew it wasn't quite the right timing. God is never late. God is never early. God is always right on time. And so Haman, is, he's just ecstatic. He's just, he's, just, he's just thrilled about this. And so that night, the king goes to bed, and he can't sleep. And so he tells his servants, he said, I can't sleep. Bring me, I want to I look what's been going on in the kingdom. Bring me the chronicles so I can read them while I'm trying to go to sleep. And so he's reading the chronicles, and he sees in there that Mordecai last year found out about an assassination plot and saved the king's life, and the king didn't even know it. So the next day, now the the banquet's going to be in a day or two, the next dinner. The next day, he brings in Haman, and he says, Haman, now Haman's feeling like, man, I'm in. I'm in. The queen wants me in. I'm in. And so he says, Haman, he said, what should I as king do to honor someone who I think is extremely special? Now, Haman thinks the king's talking about him, but actually he's talking about his arch enemy, Mordecai. And so Haman says, oh, your majesty, 
I would take your royal robes and I would put them on his shoulders and I would give him your scepter and showing of great honor and I would put your jewels and garments on him and I would put him on your finest steed and I would have a servant walk him through the city shouting out, this is a man that the king greatly loves. This is a man who the king greatly admires. That's what I would do. And the king goes, that's a great idea. Tomorrow come and we'll do that. So Haman goes home and says, listen, the king's going to put me on his horse. He's going to put the robes on, and I'm going to have Mordecai walk me through shouting my praises he wouldn't bow down to me well i'm i'll show him and he says so what i want you to do is be up on the balcony and we when we come by take all the garbage and all the porta potty thunder bucket stuff you know back in those days they had a little house behind the big house and they had buckets at night said when he comes by It'll be, it'll be Mordecai leading me, dump all that sewerage onto his head while he's shouting praises to me. And though the queen and her sons go, yeah, that's what we're going to do. So the next day he comes and Haman's ready. He goes, your, your majesty, the horse is outside. Here's your robes. Here's your jewels. Here's your scepter. Here's that. He said, that's wonderful. Mordecai, come in here. And he said, Haman, put this on Mordecai's shoulders, put the jewels on him, put him on my steed, and you walk him around the city shouting, this is a man that the, that the king greatly admires. And so when they're walking by, they think it's Haman on the horse and Mordecai leading, and his own family dumps on him. So he's really upset, but they're going to go to have a dinner. And so when they get to dinner... Haman's there, Esther's there, the king's there, and the king says, this is not enough. Just having dinner with you, my love, is not enough. What can I do for you? There's got to be something I can do. And Esther says, you could spare my life. And the king says, what? He said, you could spare my life. He said, what are you talking about? He said, my king, you have signed a decree that all Jews must be killed on this day, and I myself am a Jew. He said, when did I sign that? When, when did I do that? And you, know, you think, how could the king do that? You know, how many times does, uh, does uh, Nancy have to say, you know, pastor, you got this date? And I go, when did I say yes to that? <laughs> right? And so he didn't even, when did I do that? How could that happen? And she said, Haman did it. And he looks at Haman and he goes, you did this? You tricked me that I would kill my bride, my queen, the love of my life? And he was furious. And so the king got up and he walked out into the Babylonian gardens, if you would. And this is, this is his, one of his pride and joys. It's so beautiful. And when, he, when the king walks out there, he sees all of his cypress trees have been cut down. The reason they were cut down is to build the gallows to hang Mordecai and his sons. And so now he's furious. The queen goes into her bedchamber, and as she goes in there, she's lying there. Haman rushes in. Now, we say it politely over the years, but as I told you, that it says that he came and fell upon her in her bed. What he was trying to do was raper and so he goes in falls on top of her the king comes back out and sees haman trying to who called for his wife to be killed and trying to rape her and he goes into a rage and says take the gallows that were meant for the jews and hang haman and his 10 sons upon the gallows and so the story is turned upside down now, the decree was written, and the way it worked in that kingdom then is that once the decree had been signed by the king, no, no one, not even the king, could turn that decree. And so the decree was still written that all the Jews 
would be killed on this day. But So what the king did is said, I can't reverse that, but what I'm going to do is give you weapons to defeat every enemy that wants to destroy you. And you can't help but think, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And so what Satan is meant for evil, God takes that, turns it upside down, and causes your enemy on this day to be defeated in every area. Somebody say amen. And of course, we know years later, the uh, uh, Esther and the king's son becomes king. He releases all the Jews, and they return to build the second temple. And now we're ready for the, the Jews have returned to Israel. They've returned to Jerusalem, and Haman's descendants are being defeated as we speak. You and I are on the winning team because the temple is about to be rebuilt with the coming of the Messiah. Let me, let me close with this. It says in ancient Jewish wisdom, Bayar, and, and what that means is God says, I am here all the time, not just when you see the sea parted, not just when you see the bush burning, but when you decide to see me, understand, I will always be here. Vayar, when you don't feel me, when you don't sense me, when the decree has been written, it's not sealed because God is working behind the scene to turn the story upside down. Now, I, wanna, I, was, I, I came in the Tiz. Tiz was getting ready for bed last night, and I'd been in my office studying, and uh, I said, you know, I, just, I would just read it. I mean, I know the story of Purim. I've got it written down. It's been there forever. And, uh, but I thought, casting of lots. I, I just felt led in my spirit to study why they rolled the dice, why they cast lots, and see if there's something in there, and, and something that, that is revealed to us. And this, you know, in ancient Hebrew, there's no word for what? Coincidence. Uh, Tiz's cancers come back, and... Uh, She'll start, uh, she'll start a, a treatment uh, Tuesday, but basically they said there's nothing they can do. And it's not a coincidence that we're studying this when God turns the story upside down, right? And so I was studying on the casting of lots, and then we're, we're going to pray for people. I was studying and casting a lot. I just decided to, 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 to look at it. And what I didn't think of was there are actually two days a year that are special days in which God instructed, led to cast the lots. The first is Yom Kippur, when they brought the two sacrifices to the gate, the high priest would cast the lots, which one would come in for the sacrifice and which one would be sent to the wilderness to break the curse. That's the casting of lots. The other one, obviously, is named after that, Purim. And here's what it said. I just read a part, small part of it, but as Tills are getting ready for bed, I, I, we read this. I came in and said, look at this. Yom Kippur is the day in which God turns your situation spiritually upside down. Every sin is forgiven. It's the most powerful spiritual day of the year. Purim is the most physical day of the year. Purim celebrates the salvation, not from the spiritual, but from the physical. Purim is the greatest day of miracles, a miracle in which the natural order is not merely circumvented or superseded but in which the natural itself becomes the instrument of the miraculous. The same is true on every individual level. The ultimate transcendence of materiality is achieved not by depriving the body and suppressing the physical self, but by transforming the body, the physical, into an instrument of God's divine will. So the purpose is the day, so Purim is the day that we see the most powerful physical miracles. 
Yom Kippur is the day that empowers us to rise above the constraints of physical and rationality, but Purim is the day that empowers us to live a physical life that is a vehicle for a supernatural physical and a supernatural rational commitment from God. This is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Would you stand up with me all over the, over the building? And uh, w- w- anybody today that needs God to do a miracle, this is the day of miracles. Now, God is God 24-7. He's, he's a God every moment of every day. Can I have an amen on that? Can I get a witness? God is God every day. But he gives us these appointed times, and Tiz taught it so well on our television program the other day. He gives us these appointed times because this is when he's closer. On Yom Kippur, he's spiritually closer. That if whatever we've done, we come before him and it's forgiven and it's cleansed and it gives us a new year, a new beginning. But today is a day of physical miracles. Now that physical miracle may be your health. It may be a physical miracle in that the enemy's divided your family or that physical miracle may be something in your finances. It doesn't matter. And it may look like it's impossible. And you know what? That's what we just heard. But our God is a God of supernatural miracles. Amen. But can I tell you that this begins by knowing your God. So I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed. Before we pray for a miracle in your life, the greatest miracle is knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, Tiz said something to me the other day, uh, last night when I read this, and she said, I can't imagine going through life without God in my life and a strong team in my life, a strong family, a strong uh, church group. So, yeah, receiving Jesus is about making heaven your home, absolutely. But it's also about there's an answer here on life, when Haman has written a decree against you and God will come in and turn your story upside down. So as every head is bowed, every eye is closed right there in your seat or you're watching around the world, you're here right now and you say, Pastor Larry, would you remember me in prayer? I need to give my life or rededicate my life to the Lord. Maybe you've never been born again or maybe you have and you know what? Over the years, you've kind of fallen away. You've kind of gotten lukewarm and today's a great day to come back because you know, you, 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 you don't want to go and you don't want to go and ask Jesus back into your life when the enemy's breaking into your home. You want to have that relationship with Jesus where he goes with you wherever you go. So as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one's looking around. You say, Pastor, would you remember me in prayer this morning? I want to give my life or rededicate my life to the Lord. Lift your hand up all over the building and, and hold it there the whole time where I can see it. I see that hand, that hand, that hand. Just keep it up. That hand, 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 that hand. Keep it up. That hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. I see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. God bless you. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep them up. Keep them up. I see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. I see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. I see that hand, 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 that hand. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, that hand, that hand way in the back. God bless you. Give them a great big clap offering, would you please? Now, we're going to all pray together. We're going to all pray together. But I want you to understand, we look at this and we, we, sat in the doctor's office last week and uh, and I'm so glad I know a God that can do exceedingly abundantly above anything we can ask or think. So I know God can do that. That's why I showed the picture of lion, the the thing of lion. And, uh, you know, immediately, immediately, 
I want him out. I knew today was going to be a day of miracles for all of us. So we're going to pray a prayer of salvation and everything, but if you need a miracle, you know, I asked Tiz, I asked Tiz, I said, you sure you want to go in today? Because she's not feeling well. And she goes, no, I'm, I'm, I want to pray for people. She didn't say, I want to be there to be prayed for. She said, I want to pray for people. So girls, come on up. Come on up. I don't know if Luke's here. Luke's in the upstairs. But if you need a miracle in your life, why don't we all just get a miracle together? So if you need a miracle in your life and you say, God, I am, I am, I am ready to, for you to turn my story upside down, come down and meet us here. Come down and meet us here. Just whatever it is. It can be your home. It can maybe... Maybe you've got an evil report from the doctor or maybe from the bank. Come on all the way down. Come on all the way down. Just come down. And by stepping out, what you're saying is, is I am, I, I, I feel like by stepping out today, we could have just prayed for you in your seats. Come on all the way down. But I feel like it's you going, to, you're Esther going before the king and, and the king of this world and saying, listen, my God is going to turn my story upside down. So it may, be, it may be something that is in the courts. It may be something in the doctor's office. It may be anything. And we know that there are people watching all over the world that are with us. And, and we, can't, we can't be in the room with you, but our heart and our spirit is in whatever room you're in. And God is going to do that miracle for you. You saw Lion. No child has ever survived that kind of leukemia. Well, we need that miracle, that same miracle again. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen? And so this is going to happen. And, and God doesn't love Lion or Tiz or me or any. God loves us all equal the same. He's all equal the same. How many of you here need a physical miracle? You need a physical miracle. Somebody put, put your hands on somebody around them. Men on men if we can. Lift your hand up if you need a physical miracle. You need a physical miracle. God can turn that story upside down. You know, they told my parents, your son's a junkie. Once a junkie, always a junkie. The world says it can't happen, but the word says who the son sets free shall be free indeed. How many of you here have a child or someone you love that's on drugs or is bound by something? Lift your hand up. Look, did, did God set me free? He can set your child free, right? Our God still opens prison doors. Amen? So let's lift our hands, all of us. You, you that are back there, lift your hands. You that are watching by television, by stream, lift your hands up. And we're all under a giant canopy of God's grace. And let's say this together. All of us say it out loud. Say, Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I know I've sinned. We've all sinned. But I know this. You love me so much. You sent Jesus Christ to pay the price in full for all my sin. Right now, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Now say this with authority. Satan, get out of my life. Get out of my mind. Get out of my body. Get out of my spirit. Get out of my home. Get out of my family. Get out of my finances. Get out of my future. I declare in the name that's above every name, above cancer, above divorce, above drug addiction, above anger, above alcoholism, above every name. I declare in that name who the sun sets free is free indeed. And today that miracle is mine. Not someday, today in Jesus name, amen and amen. Now give the Lord a clap offering and say, I receive my miracles. You want to say something? So I just want to say real quick is that, um, you know, this 
this is a little unnerving for us, but I'm, we're stronger than ever in faith. And you know, it's not our first rodeo. <laughs> we defeated cancer with Lion. We defeated it already three times with me. And so we're getting ready to defeat it the fourth time. Amen. 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 Because there is nothing, not even the C word, right. that is stronger than the power of our God. We know his power. We've seen his miracles through this entire journey. We're going on over five years with this, almost six years with Lion. And we know how to kick tail. Amen. And um, so we're approaching it and we don't want, uh, we don't want you to be sad. We don't want you to be, you know, mournful because we're not. We are fired up and we are kicking tail one more time. And I'm telling you, God has never failed, not right. one moment. That's why we wrote the book called Miracles by the Moment, right. because there's the big C, but there's all the journey along with it. And that's where he meets us every moment of every single day. And so be joyful with us, be excited, and be in faith with us, because we stand in that same faith for you. Right. Everything that you face, everything that you've gone through and will or maybe might go through, you have a family that stands with you. And I know that we have a family that stands with us. Amen. And we love you and we're so grateful for you. And please always, always keep in mind that, you know, cancer is something that doesn't just affect that one person. It affects the entire family. So please cover my fam through all this like you have been because it's it's hard on everybody but um we're gonna do this yeah we're, we're gonna, gonna do, do this gonna and do that it. little video you saw of lion we never could imagine six years ago that we would see that but we stood for it and we envisioned those things within our mind and today when i saw that i thought I'm going to see his, him do a concert like that when he's in his old age. <laughs> Amen. 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 Thank you so much. We love you, and we are praying just as hard for you as I know you'll be praying so, for us. So here's, here's what we're going to ask you to do for, for Tiz and for everyone else that needs a miracle this week. And I was reading that, and when Esther said, uh, Mordecai said, Esther, such a time as this. And Esther says, Get everybody together, the power of unity. Get everybody together, let's fast. Let's fast for three days. And so I was reading that and I and I felt that for ourselves. We leave in a few hours for Israel and we're gonna be at the Western Wall. We have Jewish people praying for us all over. And then in the back, Pastor Wannerson and Pastor John and everybody said, we need to, we need to fast. So I wanna encourage you to fast uh, for Tiz, for all of us, because uh, if I can correct one thing that Tiz said, Cancer's the little C. Jesus Christ is the big C. He's the big C. And uh, remember I told you in faith, when you're in faith, if, if you, you're going through the tunnel, look for a light at the end of the tunnel. And if you don't see it, just create a light. Just fo focus on something. So we went there and talked to the doctor and, you know, they're just, you know, just the, the way they are. And, uh, and uh, as we're walking out, you know, when, when the, the cancer came back the last time, they put her on this treatment and her numbers, her, her cancer, tumor numbers just plummeted. And we thought, man, I mean, almost, it almost got to normal. And then for the last six months, they start, or six months started growing and just growing, growing. That's when they knew something was wrong. And so we got this word and, and we're walking out and we're going, you know what? They are, and, and I say this with all respect of great doctors and nurses, but they are practicing medicine. He's the great physician. And I, and I say that, I say that with the utmost respect. But as we're walking out, Tiz comes back to the counter and says, just out of curiosity, what's my, what, and, and she hasn't been on any treatment. The, the other treatment was taking it down and then it wasn't working and it started coming back. And she said, just out of curiosity, what's my tumor count? 
and they gave it to her and somehow it's down. Somehow, no treatment or anything, somehow it's down. So instead of focusing on what the scientists said, we're focusing on the miracle is already taking place. And so wh while I'm in, while I'm in, uh, it, while Katie and I and Scott are in Israel, Tiz will, will go up and she'll get her, her blood test Monday and then start this treatment uh, Tuesday, it'll be every week. Um, even though they said treatments, you know, we'll just do it. And, uh, but I believe when we call home Tuesday, she's gonna say the numbers are down again. The numbers are down again. So come in agreement with us. Because what a mighty God we serve, amen? What a mighty God we serve. And so, Father, we release that miracle power of God on all of us in every area. And Father, we know that this is all happening for such a time as this, that during this appointed time, no matter what Haman says, you are almighty God, and you are working with us behind the scenes and turning our story upside down once and for all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. We love you guys. God bless.